Welcome back everyone. We are here today with lecture number 15 on some significant cultural and social changes that are going to take place during the late 19th century, a period of time that is sometimes referred to as the Victorian era. One of the most significant changes that will take place will come in the realm of scientific inquiry. Darwin initially planned to follow a medical career, that is, until he started to get sick while watching surgeries in his schooling. So in 1831, he eagerly joined a five-year scientific expedition on the survey ship, the HMS Beagle. You can see a map on the slide of the many places across the globe that Darwin will travel on this research expedition. And what truly transformed his thinking was when the mission came to the Galapagos Islands about 500 miles west of South America. Darwin noticed that each island supported its own form of a bird, a particular type of finch. They were closely related from island to island, but they also differed in several important ways. On his return to England in 1836, Darwin tried to, tried to solve the riddles of these observations and the puzzle of how species that are very similar might evolve. What he will propose is a theory of evolution occurring by the process of natural selection. The animals or plants best suited to their environment were more likely to survive and reproduce, thus passing on the characteristics which help them survive to their offspring. In this way, gradually, a species changes over time. This is known as natural selection or survival of the fittest. As Darwin worked through his scientific principles, he kind of kept a lid on it. He kept it secret for a number of years. Why? Well, at this time, most Europeans believe that the world was created by God in seven days, as described in the Bible. His theory of evolution, though, dramatically enlarged that time scale for how long it might take for new species to evolve. Still, in 1859, Darwin published On the Origin of Species, and the book was extremely controversial for this reason. The logical extension of Darwin's theory of evolution of all species included human beings in that, that Homo sapiens was simply another form of animal that had evolved over time. Darwin's theory of natural selection will be co-opted by a number of business leaders during the 19th century. What started out as a scientific theory applied to biological processes will be adapted by thinkers such as Herbert Spencer into social Darwinism. Herbert Spencer will, will argue that human beings, individuals, groups, and even races of humans were subject to the same laws of natural selection as Charles Darwin had perceived in plants and animals in, na in nature. Now, Charles Darwin never approved of this use of his biological principle, but that didn't matter. Spencer and other advocates of social Darwinism will argue that just as organisms evolve over time, where only the strongest organisms survive, that entire civilizations were similar. This theory was used to support laissez-faire capitalism and political conservatism. Class stratification was justified that it was just a natural state of inequality among individuals. And because they argued that this was a natural state, they didn't believe that anything should be done to alleviate the plight of the poor. Uh, this is a, a hands-off uh, from the standpoint of the government type of theory, social Darwinism. Don't interfere in the economy. Don't interfere with any sort of social services to try to lift people out of poverty. That everything was supposedly natural and you must let nature take its course. The poor, therefore, were considered unfit, that they were just slower, dumber, uh, you name it. So this is obviously a highly exploitative way of looking at the world, that those who are wealthy deserve their wealth and that those who are not wealthy deserve to live in squalor. This theory was also used to rationalize European imperialism and racist beliefs about the justness of Europeans establishing and subordinating colonial societies around the world, such as the scramble for Africa and the pernicious Anglo-Saxon myth that I mentioned in a prior lecture. We'll see another major change during the late 19th and early 20th century regarding the faith of Judaism. 
generations worth of anti-Semitism, discrimination against Jewish peoples in Europe and in other areas of the world, had are going to cause a number of Jewish leaders during this period to say, you know what, we're harassed wherever we go. Um, we are often unfairly targeted when things go wrong and unfairly blamed as being the cause of other people's problems. So why don't we establish a safe homeland for ourselves? So Zionism is a Jewish nationalist movement that had its goal as the creation and support of a Jewish national state in Palestine, the ancient homeland of the Jews. And in 1917, Great Britain will support this Zionist push into Palestine with the Balfour Declaration. As a result, we will begin to see thousands and thousands of Jewish settlers coming from uh, Eastern Europe, coming from Russia, coming from Western Europe, coming from around the world, descending upon the uh, region known as Palestine. Now, while this might seem like an ideal fix for the Jewish populations that were coming, they could now feel safe in, in their own homeland. They're not coming to an empty piece of real estate there were already large populations of Arab Muslims that lived in the region. And for many of them, their homeland is now being invaded by these outsiders. So this is an issue that we're going to circle back to after World War II when we talk about the uh, state of Israel and its creation. So we've talked about Enlightenment thinkers such as Mary Wollstonecraft, who began challenging society's traditional views of women, uh, but little was actually changing regarding the many restrictions women experienced on their lives. All the way back to the world of ancient Greece, the philosopher and scientist Aristotle wrote, As regard the sexes, he said, the male is by nature superior and the female inferior, the male ruler and the female subject. Fast forward now to the Victorian era, and that view was still commonplace. Indeed, there was a lot of pseudoscience in the age that set out to prove that women were lesser creatures than men. And historians often refer to the notion of separate spheres of influence, and we take this from some of the language that these people were using themselves during the time period. Uh, women's sphere of influence was the private sphere of the home and hearth. They were thought to be intellectually inferior to men as well as physically inferior to men. The only way they were considered to be superior to men was that they were thought to be more moral creatures. And so as a result, they needed to stay within the home. Uh, they needed to take care of the children and wait on their husbands. Men occupied the public sphere of influence. So that is going to vote on election day. That is going out into the workplace and uh, so forth. Despite the fact that these views prevailed for such a long time, we will see the beginnings of the suffrage movement, the push for women to get the right to vote. The U.S. suffrage movement began early, as early as the 1848 Seneca Falls Convention. We will see that in Britain it took a little bit longer. Uh, we will see suffrage just there, uh, such as Emmeline Pankhurst, will be working towards trying to attract attention to this issue. Many of the tactics that U.S. reformers like Alice Paul and also British reformers like Emmeline Pankhurst employed were protest marches, going on hunger strikes, and over time, even though we see a lot of resistance by men and women to women being granted the right to vote, fortunately we will see in 1918 women over the age of 30 procured the right to vote in uh, Britain, and we'll see that uh, after World War I in the United States, all women in the United States will be given the right to vote. And a lot of this push for political rights for women was due to the fact that we're going to see several notable accomplished female uh, scientists during this period, such as Florence Nightingale. During the Crimean War, which we discussed in a prior lecture, uh, she and a team of nurses uh, worked diligently to clean up the highly unsanitary condition of field hospitals that British soldiers were being taken to. Soldiers often referred to her as the Lady of the Lamp or the Angel of the Crimea. She helped to reduce hospital deaths due to infection and poor sanitary practices by two-thirds during the war. She wrote quite a bit about new antiseptic techniques and helped to spark international health care reform. She also had the gift of mathematics and became a pioneer in the, veal, in the field of visual presentation of mathematics, statistical graphing. Indeed, in 1859, she became the first female inducted into the Royal Statistical Society. 
Marie Curie was another highly trained and very influential female scientist during this period. She worked with her husband Pierre Curie in physics and mathematical sciences at the University in Paris at the Sorbonne. The couple worked assiduously for years studying the new field of radioactivity. Their work gradually led to the isolation of radium and polonium. Together they were awarded one half of the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1903. After her husband died in a tragic street accident, she then took his place on the faculty at the University of Paris as professor of physics, the first woman to occupy that spot. She continued her research and received a Nobel Prize in 1911 for chemistry. In addition to some exciting social and scientific changes during the Victorian era, we will also see new cultural developments appearing. If you'll recall our discussion in an earlier lecture about the revolutionary movement that sort of swept Europe in 1848 of all these independence movements and nationalist inspired uprisings, this is going to lead to a new generation of writers and artists known as romantics, practicing romanticism, a way of looking at the world through their imagination, uh, art, literature colored by strong emotions such as pride passion, heroism, exalting the beauty of nature. Romantic composer Ludwig von Beethoven strove to elicit very strong emotions in his listeners. He said, quote, music should strike fire from the heart of man and bring tears from the eyes of woman. And you can see painter Charles Baudelaire's quotation here on the slide that romanticism as a movement, as an artistic movement, is situated neither in choice of subject nor in exact truth, but a way of feeling. It was all about trying to evoke a certain feeling in the listener or the reader or the viewer. So you can see, for example, Albert Bierstadt's work on a storm approaching the Rocky Mountains, how the whole scene is very dramatic with the tall clouds in the sky, a sort of a looming sense of foreboding. Other romantic artists, uh, such as Daniel MacLeese, are going back in time to the romantic myths of the Renaissance and trying to uh, inspire uh, emotions and passions in their readers and in their viewers. Now, in direct contrast to the Romantic movement of the early 19th century, as the Victorian age moves on and we see industrialism beginning to take over in many areas of the continent and in the Americas, we're going to see now a younger generation of writers and artists who wanted to ground their work in the sometimes harsh reality of this industrializing world around them. Instead of art as escapism, which is what many of the romantics want to do, just to take their readers or their viewers or their listeners on an escape from reality, realism was the opposite of that. Look, for example, at the drab earthen tones of several of the paintings, uh, one by Corbert and one by Daumier, on the slide here. These are scenes of everyday life. These are not dramatic images from mythology or majestic natural scenes. These are regular folks. And in many cases, these realist art, um, authors and writers and painters are taking their cue from the kind of difficult lives of the poor, of the industrial working class during this period. And among these realist authors or painters, there's often a deep moral or social consciousness embedded in their, in their works. They want people to say, wow, is this really the desperate situation that the working class in London or in Vienna are experiencing? They want to wake people up. They want there to be uh, more uh, social services to try and lift people out of the grinding poverty of the day.